So, the day of the Lord is referred to as future due to Paul's comforting message to the Thessalonians. Not concerned, he's comforting. It hadn't happened yet, you're okay. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 5. Pick this up in the context. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, up to him, caught up in the clouds, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us. Isn't this comforting? To the effect that the day of the Lord has come. It will be devastated. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Of course, this letter, interesting. Paul is writing a letter. He's writing a letter. He, he's back uh, on earth too. He's, he missed the rapture. If that's the case, obviously not. Who opposes and exalts himself over every so-called God, the man of, of sin, the man of lawlessness, and our, our object opposes every object of worship? He's taken over the world's religions. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Interesting. He goes right to the temple of God, which points to the one true religion, except he's blasphemed it. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? The Apostle Paul also stated in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, that the Thessalonians were not in the same time of the tribulation, in spite of false reports. To the contrary, they were not in that time of the tribulation. For then we affirm that they would not go through it by indicating that certain events had not yet occurred which would only be part of that terrible time. Hadn't happened yet, so you're not in it. Paul's comforting message to the Thessalonians would seem untrustworthy and unbelievable if the Thessalonians, who were alive at the time of his letter, were not to see their loved ones who had already died and until, until after they potentially went through the tribulation, which has always been imminent. This, this uh, rapture. This would not then be a comforting message and therefore would not belong to, in Scripture if the saints were not to be raptured before the time of God's great wrath. So that's kind of like pre-trib? Yes. Since all believers are saved solely by grace through faith because their Lord Jesus Christ received the wrath that was due to them for their sins on the cross, then why would this church be further subjected to wrath? Another point, against mid-trib and post-trib. So why be subjected to the wrath that is due to the world that has rejected Christ? We haven't. No, it's just a matter of accepting. Are we unfaithful? You bet. Sad to say. Confess and move on. But the uh, the holiness that you're going to receive in your resurrection body has nothing to do with how well you behaved in this temporal life or everything to do with that moment of faith alone and Christ alone that you initially uh, uh, gave to Christ and then thereafter you're sealed in Him by the promised Holy Spirit. Point 12. Since most church age believers have already died and are present with the Lord and were not subject to purification and refining, as some contend, the kind of wrath is re as revealed in the tribulation period passages, then to propose that the remaining few in the last days will be put through a purification and refining in the tribulation wrath of God is not consistent. It's ridiculous. We got thousands, millions, millions of Christians who've died throughout the ages of this 2,000 year church age that are not going to be subject, and certainly they might be subjected to some uh, chastisement and discipline, but they, 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 they're dead now. So just the few that remain, uh, they're not going to be punished be, because uh, of turning away from God. Uh, they, they're born-again children of God. If they turned away, they'll be disciplined through lack of rewards, but uh, they're, they're secure in their salvation because of the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. So if the church is to be purified by going through the tribulation wrath, what about 95% of the church age believers, 95% <clears throat> who lived in earlier times and died beforehand and therefore are already in heaven and have missed the tribulation? Why not they bring them back and, and throw them in the, in the mix of the tribulation period? Were they that much better Christians than those poor believers who lived at the end of the church age like we are now and would face catastrophes and disasters, deprivation, fugitive living and martyrdom such as the world has never seen? for the purpose of purification? I would, wouldn't wish or preach or pray or impose that on anyone who has been saved by grace through faith, and neither does the Bible impose that. Other passages which indicate that the church-age believers will not be present in the tribulation period. For the judgment seat of Christ for believers take place, takes place in heaven, unlike the events of the second coming which occur on the earth. So if we get the judgment seat of Christ, 
you'll suffer loss or be rewarded with rewards. But that's in heaven. You have to be off the planet to have that happen. Let us rejoice and be glad, Revelation 19.8, and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. Who's that? That's us. Fine linen, rewards, bright and clean, was given her, the church, the bride of Christ, Ephesians 5, 25 to 32. And to wear fine linen, this is in quotes, in parentheses, in Revelation, the actual text. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So the church age believers will be with our Lord at his second coming, clothed with part of the rewards they received for the righteous acts. Those meted out to them at the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. Such dispensing of rewards that they gotta, they have to get them in heaven in order to be with him in a second coming, right? So the, such dispensing of rewards must have occurred while the church age believers were with our Lord in heaven after he took them back with himself to heaven prior to his second coming, thus missing the tribulation on the earth during that time. So excuse me, got to leave now. Tribulation, okay, I got to go to someplace else like heaven to get rewards the fine linen and so on, which I'll be wearing when I come with the Lord at the second coming. Does that mean pre-trib? Absolutely. Second Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. First Corinthians 3.11-15 For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation, faith alone in Christ alone, using gold, silver, and costly stones, faithful acts are wood, hay, or stubble. Not so faithful, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will, the day of the Lord. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. So he don't, doesn't lose his salvation. Notice that. He does not lose his salvation. He loses rewards. And it will be sufferable because those will be great benefit and you realize what you've lost for the rest of eternity. So he himself will be saved because it's by grace through faith alone, but only as one escaping through the flames. You'll bring nothing to you to, have to go to heaven with. So all church age believers have already been rewarded before the second coming and are with our Lord coming from heaven at that second coming, showing evidences of those rewards, fine linens. Then the judgment seat of Christ must have occurred before the second coming, evidently in heaven, during the same time period as the earthly tribulation period is ongoing. So the rapture evidently brings all church-age believers into heaven before the tribulation period begins in order for them to attend the judgment seat of Christ, get their rewards, and come back with him in the second coming. Amazing. So... Point B, this restrainer of sin, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way, necessitating the church to go likewise, since it was indwelt with the Holy Spirit. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6-7. And, and now you know what is holding him, the land of lawlessness, back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back, God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, quoted above, states that the coming of the man of lawlessness will not occur until after what is holding back or restraining sin is taken out of the way. This is all orchestrated by the sovereignty of God. This doesn't happen uh, unforeseen. And the, that restrainer is the Holy Spirit who indwells all church-age believers. So when he goes, we go. The only agent which can restrain sin is God, and historically this has been the Holy Spirit's work. Since he is removed, and since all church-age church believers are permanently indwelt by the Spirit, then the church must be removed also in the rapture. Robert Thomas, Expositor's Bible Commentary. So he, author Paul, can declare, you know what is holding him back? Now should be connected with what is holding him back to indicate that holding back is a present phenomenon. It is evident from the context and directly stipulated in verse 7. So, to catch a time, that which is holding back, is a neuter title for this restraining force. The word recurs in the masculine in verse 7, where it is translated, who holds it back? So, proposed identifications of this, to catch a time, have been multiple because of inability to explain the neuter masculine combination. Such suggestions as the preaching of the gospel, the Jewish state, the binding, of Satan, the church, Gentile world, dominion, and human government are improbable. 
to identify to Ketchetan, Ketchetan, the supernatural force or person hostile to God is difficult in a paragraph such as this because the restrainer is limiting Satan, not cooperating with him. So a popular understanding since early times has been that this is a reference to the Roman Empire, which is neuter and its ruler, masculine. Paul had several times benefited from the intervention of the Roman government, Acts 17 and 18. In other writings, he limits the role of human government, though preferable to some other solutions, this explanation is disappointing in several ways and doesn't fit. To predict the demise of the Roman Empire is a very uncharacteristic of Paul. Then, too, Roman emperors sometimes precipitate in anti-Christian activities rather than restrain them. The elimination of this solution is sealed when we remember that the Roman Empire has long since ceased to exist and the appearance of Christ or the lawless one has yet to take place. So it is evident that the restrainer to accomplish his missing mission must have supernatural power to hold back a supernatural enemy, and God in the outworking of his providence is the natural answer. Genesis 6.3 Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. Man is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years in those days. Look at John 16.7-8 But I, Jesus, tell you the truth. It is for you your good that I'm going away, unless I go away, the counsel of the Holy Spirit will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. There is your answer, the Holy Spirit. First John 4, 3-4, But every spirit relative to which is behind the teaching of the prophets, true or false, that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You dear children believers are from God and have, have overcome them. So them, the false prophets and their false message, which is characterized by the spirit of the Antichrist, you dear children are saved unto eternal life. Because the one, okay, here it is, because the one, the Holy Spirit who is in you is greater than the one Satan who is in the world, who restrains sin. And does it in this way that's depicted specifically in all these passages, the Holy Spirit. Notice that the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, and thus is key in the protection of the believer from the effects of the spirit of the Antichrist via the efforts of false prophets. Thus it is the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit to restrain the spirit of the Antichrist from overcoming believers. Thomas goes on to say, reference to God is favored by the restrainer's harmony with divine purpose and a divine timetable at the proper time. So, Yet to say that God is the restrainer is not quite enough to explain the variation in gender. To one familiar with the Lord Jesus' upper room discourse, as Paul undoubtedly was, fluctuation between neuter and masculine recalls how the Holy Spirit is spoken of. Either gender is appropriate, okay, depending on whether the speaker or writer thinks of natural agreement, masculine because of the Spirit's personality, or grammatical, neuter because of the noun pneuma. The special presence of the Spirit as the indweller of saints will terminate abruptly at the perusia, or the appearance of the Holy Spirit, as it began abruptly at Pentecost. Once the body of Christ has been caught away to heaven, the Spirit's ministry will revert back to what he had did, did before believers during the Old Testament period, his function of restraining evil through the body of Christ. That will see similarly to the way he terminated the striving in the days of Noah. At that point, the reins will be removed from lawlessness and the satanically inspired rebellion will begin, hence the worldwide flood and, and the difficulties in Israel. It appears that to Tokachetan, what is holding back, was well known at Thessalonica as a title for the Holy Spirit, on whom the readers had come to depend in their personal attempts to combat lawlessness. That's why the, the believers at Thessalonica were so successful in Macedonia and Achaia. They were led by the Holy Spirit in advance, in advance of Paul's teaching of them. They took it to heart in their spirit and moved on and, and did such a great job at evangelizing the area. Compare 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And notice that God the Holy Spirit provides information, faith, and joy in the face of severe suffering as a result of persecution of the Thessalonian believers, combating the spirit of the Antichrist, resisting sin and in the lives of the Thess Thessalonians and in our lives. Okay. More on this next time. The 24 elders are also evident.